Today is Thursday, 7th October, and the world is still um, is still digesting the news from the United States of Donald Trump's clear victory in the US presidential election. As of this time, it's clear that he has won, not just in the Electoral College by a clear margin, but that he has also won the popular vote by a clear margin as well, and that there's been a major Republican victory in the Senate with the um, makeup of the new Senate tilted decisively in the Republicans' favour. That, by the way, ought to make it easier for Donald Trump to appoint uh, his senior officials. I remember that back in 2017, after he became president the first time, months passed and huge difficulties arose because the Democrats in the Senate uh, at a time when uh, the membership of the Senate was evenly divided and when much of the Republican Party in the Senate was structurally hostile to, the, to Donald Trump. Anyway, the Democrats at that time basically obstructed and slowed down confirmation of the president's choices for um, the senior positions in his government. I can remember that it took, took weeks and months for many, many positions to be filled, and that caused considerable difficulty for Donald Trump and for his government in the first few months after he took office. So this time, hopefully, that will be avoided. There is now a decisive Republican majority. The new vice president is much more in tune with Donald Trump's thinking than the previous vice president Donald Trump had to work with, Mike Pence was. And one senses that the balance within the Republican Party in the Senate is much more favourable to him this time than it was back in 2017. Over and beyond that, of course, in 2017, the President Donald Trump um, was under investigation, <laughs> even though there were pretenses that he was not. He was under investigation by the Justice Department, by James Comey at the FBI, by, by Robert Mueller subsequently, um, with many people in the United States, including in the Senate, believing that he might have had some kind of dealings with Vladimir Putin, which enabled him to win the election in 2016. And it's clear that this time we're not going to get any of that <laughs> in the aftermath of his inauguration in January. So he has, Donald Trump has, <clears throat> a, a much greater authority to appoint officials uh, favourable to himself, and we will see how he exercises it. I would quickly say, and this is just by way of, <laughs> um, if you like, a parenthesis, I, I, I'm not going to discuss US domestic politics in any very, much, any very great detail. Anyway, briefly, the fact that there is a Republican majority in the Senate, and a convincing one, and likely, as I understand it, to remain in place um, throughout the period of Trump's term. Uh, the structure of the Senate makes it unlikely that the Democrats will be able to regain control of the Senate in 2026, or at least that's what I've been told. Anyway, that could potentially mean that if Supreme Court vacancies come about, then Donald Trump is in a position to tilt the balance of the Supreme Court even further in a conservative direction than he did in his first term. But I'm not going to dwell on that. That's something for others to think about or perhaps to discuss and think about on another day. Anyway, the world, as I said, is waiting to see what Donald Trump is going to do. Um, he must be... Um, at this moment in time, savouring his victory and 
presumably resting after what has been a grueling year and grueling years before that. But there are suggestions that he will go he will go forward and make his picks for the top positions fairly soon. Now, before I discuss this further, there is one very final thing about the election itself, or rather about the response to it in the United States and by and in Europe by Donald Trump's opponents and critics, which I I do feel I have to make. And that is that perhaps unsurprisingly, his critics, his opponents in the Democratic Party, in the media, in Europe, have greeted his re-election with horror and dismay. But there's been what I find a troubling tendency to blame the American people for the outcome, to criticise the American people for having the effrontery to vote for Donald Trump and to heap, frankly, abuse on them. And I don't think that's an overstatement. There have been some articles which I have seen in the United States, in Britain, and specifically in Germany, which have said things about the 72 million people who voted for Donald Trump, which, frankly, I I personally find extremely troubling. Now, just to say quickly one thing, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but democracy (laughs) is supposed to be ruled by the people. That is what the Greek word democracy means. Demos is the people in Greek, and kratos is the power. The people have the power. And the nature of democracy is that the people are supposed, in theory at least, to elect or appoint the people that they decide should govern them according to the constitutions and the laws of the given state. And... Speaking for myself here, as somebody who's always been very much of a democratic point of view, supported democracy, I am going to say this. I have lived through many elections in Britain, in Greece, in other countries, especially in Britain, of course. The earliest election of which I have a clear memory is the British general election of 1970. In the vast majority of elections that I have lived through, I think it is fair to say that the winner was not the person I wanted to win. I would go further still, and I would say that if we're talking about British general elections, I can only think of one in which the outcome was one I was actually happy with. That, however, has never made me waver in my view that the people have the right to choose whom they wish to represent them and to govern them through the electoral process. It has never been my position that people should be abused, criticised in the kind of, or rather insulted in the kind of way that they are being, uh, called all kinds of names, for doing that, I think that doing so shows a fundamental failure to understand what democracy is, or perhaps more properly, a lack of genuine, sincere belief in it. (laughs) So I would prefer it if this sort of thing stopped, and the more it continues, the more doubtful I'm going to become about the extent to which the people who write these articles and heap on the people who voted for Donald Trump these insults, that they really do believe in democracy and democratic values and all of those things that they profess they do. I say that this, after all, having been a election in which those very same people have been telling us incessantly that they wanted to vote for one candidate in place of another because they believe 
in democracy and want to see it preserved. Anyway, I'm not going to say more about that than this. But anyway, I just feel I should express my clear views about this. Anyway, let's let's go back and discuss what is being said about Donald Trump's potential picks. Now, it's quite obvious to me, reading the media in the United States, that there has that there is, as is very often the case, jostling for positions. Some people in the United States are trying to push very hard candidates like uh, Mike Pompeo and Tom Cotton on Donald Trump. Mike Pompeo has been floating around um, Trump for quite a long time. Um, and he clearly wants a senior job. And this talk that he particularly wants to be appointed defense secretary. And um, Tom Cotton is the same, and other people like him are the same as well. Um, I think it is important to say that at this moment in time, we have no reason to think that Donald Trump has made any decisions of that kind at all. And for the record, the British diplomat, Ian Proud, who I slightly know, he's actually come forward and said that he understands that Douglas McGregor, Colonel Douglas McGregor, whose opinions are certainly diametrically opposed to uh, those of people like Mike Pompeo and Tom Cotton, has been brought into the team and is having some role, perhaps, in deciding uh, things going forward, including, conceivably, who might be appointed to these top positions that we've been hearing about. So, as I said, one should not mistake jostling for position of the kind that always happens in the United States during a transition period as evidence that a decision has been made on any particular appointment. Not yet, anyway. By the way, just to just to mention again something that Alex Christoforo brought up on the Duran live stream that we did yesterday, following the um, decision, following the results of the election. Anyway, um, Alex Christoforo, my colleague and friend, reminded us that back in 2016, um, Donald Trump even seemed at times to be floating the possibility that Mitt Romney, perhaps Trump's most ferocious critic within the, Demo the Republican Party, might be appointed to the post of Secretary of State. And of course, that never happened. So as I said, let's not assume that the fact that these names are being bandied around or any other names are being bandied around is a sign that any sort of decision has been made about any particular appointments. And the same goes for various articles that are appearing in the American media, discussing various plans and ideas and projects that Donald Trump might or might not have to end the wars in the Middle East and in Ukraine. Now, I saw one report, for example, yesterday, which claimed that uh, Donald Trump wants to see the fighting in the Middle East end even before his inauguration in January. And he's going to be telling this to Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he's going to say to Netanyahu that Netanyahu should take the win, the wins in Lebanon and in Gaza. All of these senior Hamas and Hezbollah leaders have already been killed that this should be chalked up by Netanyahu as a great achievement. And in light of that, Netanyahu and his government should press forward and agree to ceasefires in Lebanon and Gaza. Well, I would like to believe that, but I am very sceptical that those sort of communications between Trump and Netanyahu are taking place. And I'm also sceptical if they are taking place that Netanyahu is going to pay any attention to them, at least at this time during the period of the transition. So 
I would regard that report as simply someone floating a set of ideas, trying to impress upon Donald Trump their own perspectives on how the crisis in the Middle East should be brought under control. And the same applies to the various articles in the Wall Street Journal and in other places that are floating around about various peace proposals that the Trump team is supposed to be coming forward with respect to ending the crisis in Ukraine. There's been a revival of the idea of going back to the proposal that was first floated by people like General Kellogg back in September, a temporary freeze, well, a freeze of the conflict uh, with threats to the Russians if they don't agree to the freeze of the conflict, a delay in Ukraine joining NATO, and um, attempts to um, integrate NATO thereafter. I said at the time that that plan really is a dead letter. There is no conceivable way that the Russians would accept it. But there have been also other plans as well, other plans that seem to revolve around the idea of a freeze, uh, suggestions that uh, the Russians will be told that Ukraine will be told that it cannot enter NATO for at least 20 years. <laughs> plans of that kind equally unacceptable to the Russians, in my opinion. But again, all of these ideas, all of these proposals, no doubt they do exist and they are being floated by various people. But for the moment, there is no reason to suppose that they actually have been accepted by Donald Trump. I think at the moment, Donald Trump is probably still working through all of the appointment positions and I don't think that he has settled on any particular plan, at least not up to this time. Again, one should not confuse the typical jostling for position that will be taking place at this time as necessarily a reliable indicator as to what will happen. In fact, I'm going to express my own personal view, that I don't think Donald Trump has any very clear ideas, either about the Middle East or about Ukraine, at this particular moment in time. He's spoken about ending the war in 24 hours. I think that what he probably meant by that was not that the war itself would come to a complete stop within 24 hours, but that American involvement in the war would come to an end within 24 hours of his becoming president. I think that is a much more plausible understanding of his perspective of things. And I have seen that even as all sorts of plans are being floated and projected and talked about and talk about soldiers being sent from somewhere to enforce whatever peace agreements various parties are proposing for the war to end, that one thing is already being made clear, that there will be no American soldiers participating in any of these uh, uh, plans, and that the United Nations also is not expected to become involved, which, to my mind, basically means that these plans already are looking pretty threadbare and unlikely to be accepted or taken further or much further going forward. So anyway, that that is my view. I will make just, again, the observation I made in my programme yesterday, which is that if you follow closely, as I have been doing, events on the battle lines, and I'm sure there are people in the Pentagon who have been doing the same, who are very well informed about the realities on the Ukrainian battle lines. If you have been following the situation closely, you will know by now that the Russians are winning the war in Ukraine and that they, with every day that passes, the balance continues to shift further and further in their favour.
The Biden administration poured arms and supplies into, U into Ukraine. They gave Ukraine a huge amount of intelligence, information. They assisted Ukraine with launching missiles. They crossed all of their own red lines in order to assist Ukraine. They imposed comprehensive sanctions on Russia. None of that worked. And the Russians are still there. Their economy continues to grow. Their army continues to advance. They are clearly winning the war. There is no way in which the United States can reverse that or change that except by escalating in a way that would involve taking on unacceptable risks, risks of a sort that the outcome of the election has demonstrated the American people do not want the United States to take on. So those who continue to talk in the United States about doing something that will supposedly put the United States in a stronger position in advance of negotiations need to understand that that has been the Biden administration's policy since at least the summer of 2022, when Biden himself, or rather the people who drafted articles for him, actually said as much in an op-ed that appeared under his name in the New York Times, that the purpose, the objective of the United States was to arm and support Ukraine, to put Ukraine in a strong position in negotiations. And despite that, despite all of the, that effort, all of those attempts, what has happened instead is that Ukraine's position in advance of negotiations has become steadily weaker since that time. So, basically, giving more weapons to Ukraine, floating ideas of freezes, doing all of these things is simply to continue where the Biden administration left off and what failed for the Biden administration, which was enthusiastic about the policy, is hardly going to succeed for a Trump administration, which one is led to believe is not. So that needs to be understood. Now, I completely accept and entirely agree with the view that it's never good to be going into a negotiation from a weak position. And that is why I personally think the best policy for the United States is not to negotiate with the Russians about Ukraine at all. Since in any negotiation that the United States engages the Russians in, the Russians have the advantage. They are in the stronger position. I think it will be false and dangerous for the United States, for the Trump administration, to get drawn into it. It would also risk the United States getting deeper into this quagmire, which is what the Ukrainian war has now become. It would give all sorts of people in the United States and in Ukraine and in Europe, people who want the war to be prolonged indefinitely, an opportunity to spoil whatever process of negotiation the administration had in mind. And I think the wiser and simpler and more straightforward and cleaner course is for the United States instead, for the Trump administration, to do that which I have said, which is tell the Ukrainians that this is the time for them to negotiate with the Russians, not for the United States to do it on their behalf, that American aid, American money and American weapons are now going to cease, supplies of them are going to cease, and that if the Europeans want to take over, they're welcome to do so, and if there is going to be a negotiation, the Ukrainians can conduct it themselves, or perhaps the Europeans can. I think in this very difficult situation, that is the best 
course, the wisest course, that the administration could follow. It may look like washing one's hands of the problem, but it was not a problem that the current, the new administration, that the new president, Donald Trump, caused. So that is what I think. And I would not be surprised that that is ultimately, that that is going to be ultimately the outcome we're going to see. I think that there may be all kinds of plans and proposals and ideas and suggestions for negotiations for outcomes to the war. But given that the Ukrainians are likely to reject everyone, and given that the Russians are likely to reject every, anyone, it is better for the United States to walk away than to become more deeply involved. That is not to say that that is a satisfactory or good outcome. But given that the Russians are winning the war, there is no good outcome to this disaster from, for the United States. Better to walk away and to say that it was the Biden administration's whole policy and idea and that they own the consequences. That's a strong position because it's true. Anyway, let's just now look at what the other side by which I mean the Russians, are saying. Because the Russians have actually been extremely forthright and very clear, crystal clear, in the hours since President Trump's uh, re-election. Now, the Russian Foreign Ministry has published a statement, and I'm going to read it in full. And it was published yesterday, and it, is a, it appears on the Russian Foreign Ministry's website. And this is what it says. I'm going to read it in full. Foreign Ministry Statement on Elections in the United States of America. The victory of Donald Trump in the presidential election and his return to the White House after a four-year break obviously reflects Americans' disappointment in the performance of the Biden administration and the election pr pr program of the Democratic Party formulated by Vice President Kamala Harris, who was hastily chosen to replace the incumbent president in the race. Despite an overpowering propaganda campaign, which Democrats launched against Donald Trump, based on the administrative resource and support from the liberal media, the Republican candidate, who relied on the experience of his previous presidency, highlighted issues that are of real interest to the electorate, namely the economy and illegal immigration, as a counterbalance to the White House's globalist course. By the way, I think that is a very accurate summary of what happened in the election. In that situation, the ruling group was unable to use the chronically ill American democracy, and the word democracy is inverted commas in this statement, which is outdated and incompatible with modern standards of direct, fair and transparent elections to prevent Kamala Harris's defeat. That's a very, very broad hint that the Russians also think that there was something wrong about the 2020 election. And what they're saying is that given the strength of feeling in the United States this time, it proved impossible to do this time that which was done back in the election of 2020. That's just to say that's that's what the um, Russians are in effect saying here. But anyway, this is what the statement then goes on to say. At the same time, there is an obvious civil discord in the United States whose electorate is split into two almost equal halves. In fact, we are witnessing confrontation between Democratic and Republican states and between the advocates of progressive, and the word progressive is put in quotation marks, and traditional values. It is possible that Donald Trump's return will fuel internal tensions and bitterness between the confronting camps. That's, as I said, the Russian 
perspective on the internal situation in the United States. Then we come to the really key points in this statement. We have no illusions about the president-elect, who is well known in Russia, or the new Congress, where Republicans have reportedly won control. The U.S. ruling political elite adheres to anti-Russia principles and the policy of containing Moscow. This line does not depend on changes in America's domestic political barometer, no matter if it is Trump and his supporters, America above all, or the Democrats' focus on a rules-based world order. Russia will interact with the new administration when it comes to the White House, firmly upholding Russia's national interests and working to achieve all the goals of the special military operation. Our conditions have not changed and Washington is well aware of them. So what the Russians are saying is, look, we understand that there is a political change in the United States. We've dealt with Donald Trump before. We know him very well. We see what's happened in Congress. We understand Congress very well. We also know that there continues to be intense hostility to Russia within the political class in the United States. And in light of this, the only thing we are prepared to do, the only thing we can do in our own national interests is this. Yes, we will have interactions with the new administration if that is what they want. But when it comes to settling the Ukrainian crisis, we will only agree to do that on the basis of the terms already set out. The terms that President Putin announced at the start of the special military operation, you, neutrality for Ukraine, a Ukraine outside NATO, denuclearization, demilitarization, denazification, all of those things. The Russians are not prepared to move, not an inch, but even a fraction of a millimetre. And they have made that, they have set that out very clearly in this statement. And we've had follow up statements from none other than Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, who is currently on a working visit to Kazakhstan, where he's had meetings with the Kazakh Foreign Minister. Kazakhstan, as he has reminded everybody, having now been invited to become a partner state within the BRICS group. And anyway, this is what Lavrov said, and he said it at a news conference. We have never rejected contact with anyone. President Putin stresses opposition every time the topic is raised. Talking is always better than getting isolated from each other. And he said this in response to a question about whether the Russians have any plans to maintain contacts with the new Trump administration. And then Lavrov went on to say this, we'll see if there are any proposals, and I reiterate that it was not us who broke off relations, and it is not up to us to suggest reviving them. If there is an initiative to sit down and have a frank conversation about where we are standing and how we should move forward without any unilateral demands, we will be ready for that. Now, notice the words, without any unilateral demands. The Russians obviously know all about these plans and proposals and ideas that are floating around Washington, that are being presented to Trump, even as we speak, that are being discussed in the media. But they are saying, look, those may be your ideas, but if you come along and tell us we must accept this and we must accept that, as far as we're concerned, those are unilateral demands made by you against us, and we are paying no attention to them. If you want a dialogue with us, if you want to have what Lavrov called 
a frank conversation. Yes, we are prepared to sit down and talk with you and to see whether we can find ways to move forward. But if you come to us with ready-made plans, plans which don't respond to our concerns, then we are going to reject them. We're going to reject them outright. And any attempt to conduct a conversation with us on that basis will get nowhere. It will be stillborn. And then we, Plavrov went on to say that the problems facing Russia-US relations are very deep, that they stem from the perception of the US elite that any rival in the international arena should be suppressed. And Lavrov concluded, of course, this position is becoming increasingly irrelevant given think how things have evolved globally. However, the Americans continue to adhere to this ideology. So that was Lavrov. And you can see that it complements precisely the position that is set out in the foreign ministry statement, which will undoubtedly have been confirmed or by Putin himself. So the Russians are not interested in discussing plans with the Americans. They have made their own demands perfectly clear. They are the ones that they set out at the start of the special military operation. They went into more detail on how they wanted things to progress at the failed Istanbul negotiations in April 2022. Putin, back in June, made it clear that the only way forward beyond that, given that Istanbul was rejected, is Istanbul plus. The Ukrainians must pull out of all of the four regions completely. They must accept neutrality. And yes, on that basis, the Russians would be prepared to talk to the Ukrainians about various other things, the size of their army, <laughs> um, uh, the rights of Russians in Ukraine and things like that. But plans for freezes, plans for uh, deployment of peacekeeping forces, lines drawn on the map, saying that this region or that region should be included in buffer zones, all of those kind of things. If they're presented by the Americans, they will be seen as unilateral demands and the Russians will reject them. So there we are. That is the Russian position. It could not be set out more clearly than it has been. And again, I do hope that this is understood in Washington, given the military realities given the realities on the battlefronts, given the economic realities as well, the fact that Russia has weathered the sanctions storm, given that Russia now has increasingly close relations with various countries, with the BRICS agreement, things have certainly moved forward. And frankly, there is no going back on that. Given that all this is so, the United States, the Americans, the Trump White House, even if it is minded to do so, is not in a position to impose terms. So that's the Russians. There are reports, again, of discussions, talks and commentaries taking place. Um, there's supposed to be attempts to try to um, sort out the try to find ways of harmonizing the Brazilian Chinese peace proposals with Zelensky's peace proposal, which is impossible, by the way, because they are completely contradictory to each other. It is like um, trying to mate <laughs> um, a lion with a kangaroo. I mean, they are, they are just totally different things. But anyway, there have been articles about this. I believe one in the New York Times. I will just say something about this. Um, about a week ago, um, there was an article in the Financial Times which spoke about um, the fact that there were discussions underway between the Russians and the Ukrainians uh, via Qatar to resume negotiations about a cessation of attacks 
on their respective energy systems. And a lot of people got very excited about this and assumed that because that article, which was clearly based on Ukrainian sources, because that article had appeared in the Financial Times, it must be that it was true. People ignored the fact that um, Lav Peskov, Putin's spokesman, straightforwardly denied that any such talks were in fact taking place. He said that it was fake news and he expressed dismay that news of that kind should be published in a prominent newspaper like the Financial Times. Well, what many people have overlooked is that over the last couple of days, no less a person than Zelensky himself has actually come forward and admitted that no talks about the cessation of mutual attacks on the energy system between Russia and Ukraine are in fact taking place. Now, as I said, because of all of the things that have been happening with the US election, um, I have found, I've not been able to find exactly the place where um, I read this and Zelensky says so many different things all the time that it's very difficult often to keep up with all that he says. But he said it clearly, as I remember. He said that, yes, the Ukrainians would like to discuss these topics with the Russians and believe that if uh, such discussions were to take place, then just possibly they might move things forward towards some kind of process which of course in Zelensky's mind would lead ultimately to the outcome that he has always said he wants which is the acceptance of his peace proposal for the Russians to pull out completely from Ukraine but anyway but Zelensky admitted that in fact no such no, no such discussions no such talks are in fact so far underway he would like it if such talks could take place, but he accepts that for the moment they are not. So when one reads in Western media outlets about discussions between the U Russians and the, and the Ukrainians or about between the Ukrainians and the Chinese and the Brazilians and discussions between leaders um, of various countries and diplomats of various countries to put together proposals. One should not mistake the chatter because that is what this is. Chatter, some of it, most of it, I suspect, coming from Ukraine itself. Chatter for the reality. The public position that the Russians have set out is extremely clear. It's been set out clearly again by the Russian foreign ministry to repeat again, Russia will interact with the new administration when it comes to the White House, firmly upholding Russia's national interests and working to achieve all the goals of the special military operation. Our conditions have not changed and Washington is well aware of them. The Russians, as I said, are not shifting. They're prepared to hold talks. They're prepared to engage the Americans in discussions, as Lavrov says, but they have not made any fundamental shift in their position. And they are not talking to the Ukrainians at this particular point in time. Now, that doesn't mean that the Trump White House should not be reaching out to the Russians. It's easy to forget that even though Ukraine has been the overwhelming and dominant issue for the last three years, um, the reality is that the Russian-American relationship should go far beyond those sort of matters. Russia, for example, is now a major player in the Middle East. It's got good relations with Iran. 
It's involved in contacts with Israel. It is positioning itself as a potential major arms supplier to Iran and to Iran's regional allies. It's got a role to play, in other words, in the Middle East. It's in American interests to make sure that that role works in harmony with whatever it is the Americans are trying to do in the Middle East, because the Russians, if they wanted to, would be in a very, very strong position to act as spoilers. The Russians, of course, also have now very strong connections with North Korea. And those connections, over time, could give the Russians a significant degree of leverage over the crisis in the Korean Peninsula. And again, it would be in US interests to find some way forward with the problems in the Korean Peninsula, and that might be achievable, or at least more likely to be achievable, if the United States is at least talking to the Russians about all of this. Then there is the problem with energy and energy issues. I was reading in the Financial Times that after all of the optimism and euphoria about how Europe has weaned itself off Russian gas, there are now once again problems in the European gas system, that Europe is at risk of again finding itself facing a crisis in the gas supply situation that supplies of liquefied natural gas upon which Europe now depends are always unstable and very volatile in terms of pricing. That with the imminent closure of the last important remaining pipeline, supplying pipeline gas from Russia to Europe, uh, the pipeline, the one part that passes across Ukraine, which still supplies, as it turns out, 5% of Europe's gas, and with possibilities of a cold winter in Europe, and with further possibilities of, of um, disruptions to supply because of the situation in the Middle East, that that could lead to further supply problems, not just in gas, but in the entire international energy system. And of course, any American president, Trump, whoever, has now seen, as a result of the election, what an enormously sensitive issue it is when prices for energy rise, how they have an immediate effect on inflation, the effect it has on living standards in the United States, as well as in Europe, and the political consequences that follow from that. And so it is logical for the United States to want to discuss energy questions with the Russians. The Saudis, by the way, major oil exporter as they are, came to that realisation around a decade ago, that if you want stability in energy markets, you can achieve that with the Russians, but not without them. And, of course, there's also the situation in Europe where uh, whatever happens now in Ukraine, there is a burgeoning political and economic crisis. The German government is collapsing. I'm going to come to that shortly. And it is again in vital US interests that the overall security situation in Europe be brought back to some level of stability. And by definition, that can only happen if there is a dialogue with Russia. And of course, an overspill of the war in Ukraine is again something which the United States should not want to see. So there are lots of reasons why the United States should be talking to the Russians. And I strongly hope and by the way, on balance, believe that those discussions with the Russians will now take place. If they don't, again, the Trump administration risks f 
falling into the same traps as the preceding Biden administration does. I'm well aware that there's all these Rand Corporation reports about squeezing the Russians and causing problems on their periphery, starting wars to weaken the Russians. We see that what all of these overcomplicated plans actually do is that in the end they make the Russians stronger and they make the Russians more hostile and instead of working to American advantage they weaken the overall position of the United States and cause major problems for the US's own allies. So a dialogue with the Russians is essential certainly it must extend to discussing Ukraine Certainly, it must deal with the issues in Europe. But any idea that the Russians are going to shift their position on Ukraine or moderate their approach there, by this point, it is at least a decade too late. Just to say. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about the Russians. I should say that apparently... There is an article in the Financial Times, though I cannot find it. It might be in one of the European or American editions of the Financial Times, which I'm not accessing, or it could be buried somewhere. <laughs> um, articles in the, United, in the Financial Times have a habit of getting buried. Anyway, there is apparently an article in the Financial Times which is saying that there is now lots of buzz and talk in the international financial markets, in the banks and investments to institutions about whether perhaps the moment has now come to start to reverse the sanctions war against Russia, to make it possible for Western traders to start trading in rubles again and even to buy rubles, whether perhaps to lift some of the restrictions on Russian banks, to make it possible for financial movements to start to resume, to do all of those sort of things. I have to say that if these discussions are taking place, then they are very premature. <laughs> I don't think that Trump is going to rush to lift sanctions against Russia, and I think attempting to do so anyway is going to be a very complicated thing to do given how difficult it is in the United States to lift sanctions at all. But it is interesting, maybe, if this article is correct, that such discussions are happening. And perhaps it may reflect accurately sentiments in the market, which is that the sanctions were a huge mistake and that the United States and the West needs to start to find some way back from them. I'm going to suggest, again, that if the Trump administration wants to make a difference, it should perhaps put the financial sanctions, which are going to be very complicated and difficult to unwind, to one side and focus on the sanctions against Russian energy. To make it possible, again, for Western countries to buy Russian oil and even Russian gas, to lift the unenforceable price gap on Russian oil, the $60 price gap, which nobody has paid much attention to, but which has caused significant disruption in the energy trade, to allow, in other words, Russian oil and gas to be traded normally again. All that the sanctions have done is created supply bottlenecks and benefited middlemen. So we now have the bizarre situation where India has become a major supplier of oil to Europe. I believe, according to some reports I've seen, which I think are probably wrong, the major, the biggest supplier, single supplier of oil to Europe, which, of course, India does not produce itself, but which, as everybody knows, it is buying from Russia. 
any situation like that where a vitally important commodity has to be traded through middlemen is economically inefficient. And one would like to believe that Donald Trump, as a businessman, and the other business people who are advising him, people like Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy and David Sachs and all of these very intelligent and wise people. Anyway, one would like to hope that they're all pointing this out to him. Lift the energy sanctions, which should be a relatively easy thing to do. Put the problem of the other sanctions to one side. Stop any idea, by the way, of floating loans or sending more loans to Ukraine. Secured by Russian money, which isn't even yours. And then, as I said, perhaps as things begin to sort themselves out and to stabilise, you can start further down the line returning to more complicated topics like whether to allow Russian banks further access to SWIFT and those sort of things. But anyway, I, I don't want to say more about this because I'm not convinced that these discussions about sanctions within the Trump team are for the moment even taking place. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say about the Russians. Of course, the Russians are not the only players. President Zelensky has sent his own congratulatory message to President Trump. It was a most bizarre message, at least at least in my opinion. It gave, bore all the um, appearance, as far as I could see, of having been written for Zelensky um, by someone else. Uh, it didn't seem to me to be uh, at all like... Um, the kind of thing that someone actually does write. Um, um, what um, the uh, message apparently said, it said this, congratulations to real Donald Trump, this is presumably on X, on his impressive election victory. I recall our great meeting with President Trump back in September when we discussed in detail the Ukraine-US strategic partnership, the victory plan, and ways to put an end to Russian aggression against Ukraine. And then the message on X went on to say that, from Zelensky purportedly, that he admires Trump's commitment to the peace, to peace through strength approach in global affairs. This is exactly the principle that can practically bring just, just peace in Ukraine closer. I am hopeful that we will put it into action together. I would have thought, by the way, that it would be that it was a major mistake for Zelensky to remind Trump of that very ill-starred meeting they had in New York in September. Um, Zelensky has gone around telling everybody since then that he floated with Trump the possibility of Ukraine acquiring nuclear weapons, which I don't think Trump was happy about at all. I remember the how the meeting ended with Trump coming out beaming and looking confident, but in no sense giving any impression that he had changed his views about anything relating to Ukraine. And Zelensky himself, as I remember, looking thunderous and angry. Now, I understand that Zelensky has had a conversation with Trump since Trump's election victory. And Zelensky, again, is putting a brave face on it all and is telling us, telling everybody that the telephone call went off incredibly well. But I just said, one should take all of that with a strong dose of salt. I, I don't think one should take this particularly seriously. But anyway, that's the Ukrainians. The British have also extended their congratulations. President Macron of France is back. He is now talking to Trump about how France and the United States could work for peace in Europe together. That would imply that Macron always on the lookout for some opportunity to advance his own prestige about which he 
seems extraordinarily obsessed, is now seeing some chance to rediscover his old persona as the peacemaker, and the diplomatic mastermind, the new Talleyrand of European diplomacy. And that he somehow thinks that um, he and Trump can do this together in some way. Again, I doubt that Trump, all the people around him, take this altogether seriously. And like pretty much everyone else, they must be by now um, tired of Macron's constant weaving and shifting of positions from sometimes appearing to be the great advocate of peace and other times the great supporter of more war. So anyway, that was Macron. Perhaps a more interesting country is China, and the Chinese have also had things to say. And um, the Chinese foreign ministry tells us that President Xi Jinping has also sent a message of congratulation to Donald Trump. And it's not quite as stiff as the messages that the Russians have been sending. And this is the account that the Chinese foreign ministry is giving us of what the Chinese have said to Donald Trump. President Xi Jinping sent a congratulatory, congratulatory message to Donald J. Trump on his election as the next president of the United States. Xi Jinping noted that history tells us that both countries stand to gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. A China-US relationship with stable, healthy and sustainable development serves the common interests of the two countries and meets the expectations of the international community. It is hoped that the two sides will, in the principles of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation, enhance dialogue and communication, properly manage differences, expand mutually beneficial cooperation, and find the right way for China and the United States to get along with each other in the new era to the benefit of the two countries and the world. On the same day, this is again from the Chinese Foreign Ministry, Chinese Vice President Hang Zheng sent a congratulatory message to J.D. Vance on his election as Vice President of the United States. So a polite, but perhaps not fulsome, <laughs> congratulatory message from the Chinese, basically saying to Trump, look, we know you, we know your views, but... Let's see, nonetheless, whether we can find a way forward. It is in our interests, but it is also in yours. There's no reason why we should pursue confrontation. There is nothing fundamentally that divides us such that confrontation between our countries should happen. And if we exercise mutual respect, Peaceful co and peaceful coexistence. If we conduct our dialogue, uh, our, our dialogue, our dialogue and communication with each other, and properly manage our differences, then we will find a good way together. So it is, if you like, a signal of China's willingness to work with Trump. They're not closing the door or anything like that. But again, they're, they're making it clear. They have their interests, they will defend them, but they're not looking for a fight or a quarrel with the United States. Now, Putin himself, by the way, has not sent a congratulatory message to Donald Trump. The Russians have said that it is impossible for Putin to do that at a time when the United States is engaged in a proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. Uh, the Russians have also pointed out, these were Peskov's words, that at the moment, the general tone from the United States towards Russia continues to be one of extreme hostility. So in light of that, there has been no formal public message from the Russians congratulating Donald Trump, none from Putin himself. There are reports which I think are 
plausible and likely true that Putin has privately contacted Trump and has sent him a private message a congratulation. And I think that is a strong possibility, but the Russians are not going to make that fact public, at least not openly public in that sort of way. So anyway, there we go. Those are the various uh, world leaders who've communicated. By the way, I forgot to mention Keir Starmer has also congratulated Donald Trump on his election. He's going to have particular problems with sorting out the relationship with Donald Trump, given that the Starmer government, or to be more precise, the Labour Party, the ruling Labour Party, sent a team of 100 activists to the United States to help Kamala Harris in her campaign. And as they put it, to bring down Elon Musk, a crazy idea and an idiotic one. And of course, the British also have the problem that their foreign secretary, their foreign minister, David Lammy, um, has gone public quite recently, referring, referring to Donald Trump in the most extreme words. I understand that he called him a neo-Nazi psychopath. So that's not particularly diplomatic language from a foreign secretary. Personally, I think that Donald Trump, who was always inclined, or so it seemed to me, to be something of an Anglophile. He has, apparently his mother is from Scotland. So he had that connection, that historic connection to Britain. My impression was is that he, when he was first elected, he had every good intention to be have good relations with Britain. Anyway, I think that Donald Trump, after all that's happened in the last eight years, after encountering wall, a wall of hostility, not just from the British establishment, but from just from most of the British public, probably will want to have as little to do with Britain as he possibly can. And if so, I wouldn't blame him. But anyway, the British have sent their congratulations too. I'm not going to spend any more time about that. The other European government that is in a state of shock about Trump's election is the government of Germany. And here, the crisis that I have been talking about for some time on these programmes, and which we also discussed recently in another programme on the Duran, Alex Christoforo and I, the crisis in the German government has now burst into the open. Now, Christian Lindner refused to make any concessions as finance minister to the demands of the Greens, read by Robert Habeck and Olaf Scholz's Social Democrats. They continue to, he continued to insist on tax cuts and all kinds of things like that, um, and major cutbacks in public spending to cover the problems in Germany's budget. And then yesterday, things came to a boil. And it is very interesting what the issue of the breakdown in the relationship between Scholz and Habeck on the one hand and Lindner on the other was. Because though it has not been widely mentioned, it was Ukraine. It was the issue of Ukraine. The budget in Germany has been facing a 9 billion euro shortfall. Scholz, the leader of the Chancellor and the leader of the Social Democratic Party, Habeck, the leader of the Greens and the Economics Minister, Baerbock, the Foreign Minister who's currently in Kiev, they've all been making major promises to support Kiev to support Ukraine. And it seems that they're also wanting to work their way to support Ursula von der Leyen's proposal for the European Union to stomp up 40 billion dollars, <coughs> 35 billion euros 
in a loan to Ukraine. The loan to be repaid, at least in theory, from the proceeds of the frozen Russian assets. I've discussed this in many programs and I have explained the legal issues. And I've also explained that a decision to authorize such a loan is problematic in many countries because in theory it would require the agreement of national parliaments. Anyway, this problem came to the fore in the budget discussions in Germany because Germany has a constitutional provision which requires the budget to be in balance over a certain period. And Scholz and Habeck told, asked Lindner, the finance minister, to agree to a relaxation of the budget rule, to, in other words, ease off the break, to allow the deficit to be bigger than it might otherwise be, in order to enable the Bundestag, the German government, to authorize the German part of the loan to Ukraine. And Lindner said no. He said that doing so would be a breach of his oath and he was not willing to do it. So Lindner put his foot down. He basically said no loan for Ukraine. It can't be done. And, ha and Scholz, completely committed to supporting Ukraine, and of course also in coalition with a Green Party that he's fervid in its support for Ukraine, with Baerbock in Kiev, no doubt giving Zelensky assurances that the loan would indeed be provided. Anyway, Scholz, faced by this refusal from Lindner, went ahead and sacked Lindner. And the moment Lindner was sacked, the party he leads, the Free Democrats, announced they were quitting the coalition. Now, it is important to say that this whole affair has something about it of the level of political theatre. There is obviously a budget crisis in Germany, but this budget crisis is happening against the backdrop of a wider economic crisis. Volkswagen is moving towards closing down factories, three factories in Germany. There are many other problems in the German industrial system. I have discussed this at exhaustive length on these programmes, as has my colleague and friend Alex Christoforo on his channel, and we've done it also on the Duran. But anyway, all of the parties in the coalition, the Social Democrats, the Greens, the Free Democrats, are aware that there is an economic crisis, and there is, or they are aware that at some point over the next few months, there have to be parliamentary elections in Germany. So they're all positioning themselves in the light of that crisis to shift the blame from themselves onto the others in advance of those elections. So Lindner wants to say that he's taking an economically responsible position and that he is looking to conduct dynamic policies to get Germany out of its slump, but that he's been stopped from doing that by Scholz and Habeck. And Scholz and Habeck, for their part, want to say that Lindner is refusing to play ball on the existential issue of Ukraine, but also that he's making unacceptable demands in economic terms, for cuts and increases in, or rather for cuts and taxes and cuts in spending, which are clearly unacceptable to the electoral base of both of these parties. So there is a great deal of performance in this. And in Lindner's case, I have no doubt that he picked this particular issue in order to provoke his own sacking, so that the Free Democrats could quit the coalition 
and in effect bring the coalition down. Now, there was some discussion before these events that if the Free Democrats did leave the coalition, that Schultz would try and keep going until September when the parliamentary elections are supposed to take place. But he appears to have quickly realised that this was impossible, that a minority government of that kind would have insufficient support in the Bundestag. And so he has attempted to call a vote of confidence in the middle of January, looking forward to elections in March. However, Friedrich Merz and the CDU, backed by Germany's business community, are saying this is impossible. It would mean prolonging the dysfunction and chaos and paralysis in Germany right up until March. They have no interest in or desire to come to Scholz's rescue in the way that Scholz wants by teaming up with him and agreeing to some kind of um, plan to keep the German government ticking until March. They want that vote of confidence brought forward to the next couple of days and they want an election as soon as possible. And that is also the view of the two dissident parties, the IFD and uh, Sarah Wagerknecht's party. Now, many people are linking these events, this collapse of the German government. And by the way, I expect that Merz is going to get his wish. I suspect that we will have a vote of no confidence of the German government over the next couple of days and that we will be seeing elections perhaps in December or maybe in January, but certainly not in March. But anyway, many people are linking these events to the election of Donald Trump in the United States. And there may be some element of truth in this, that the um, Schultz government and the other members of the government absolutely cannot stomach the idea of having to work with Donald Trump and are looking to demolish their government and go into opposition before the terrible day of when Trump takes office. But I have to say that the strains in the coalition have been there for a very long time and they've been getting steadily worse as the crisis triggered by the Schultz government's decision in February 2022 to back the United States in its confrontation with Russia, I say the Biden administration, in the confrontation with Russia, first suspending Nord Stream 2, then agreeing to all of the most extreme sanctions packages against Russia. Anyway, um, this crisis has been brewing for a while, and if Trump's election played any role in this, I think it was probably very secondary more likely the straw that finally broke the camel's back. The camel already being under extreme stress before the straw fell. So I, I don't think that one should make too much of the fact that Donald Trump's victory took place. The, way, the better way to see this is as further proof of the damage the crisis in Ukraine is doing. The British government, the, the Sunak government, which is of course before that the Johnson government, which had been enthusiastic and fervently advocating sanctions and confrontation with Russia. It has collapsed, it's been replaced by the Starmer government in Britain, and it suffered its worst electoral defeat. The Conservative Party suffered the worst electoral defeat in its history. In France, we've seen the implosion of support for President Macron's party, which only remains a player be because of f deceitful and manipulative manipulations and Macron's own skills in playing off various factions against each other, even though that has deepened his own unpopularity within France. 
In, in, in the United States, we see the Biden administration that led the charge against Russia. It has collapsed. The president was dumped by his own party in June. He's now his purported successor, Kamala Harris, has now lost an election, um, leading to the election of Donald Trump. And what is happening in Germany is just another part of this sequence. The Alensky curse, my colleague and friend Alex Christoforo came up with, playing out in a vengeance, with a vengeance in Germany as well. And unfortunately, what has happened in France and in Britain is that despite the results of the parties that supported all the original decisions, the sanctions decisions and the confrontation decisions that were made in February and March 2022 being rejected by their electors. The policies <laughs> remain the same as the parties that win the elections, the subsequent ele ele uh, elections, just go ahead and adopt the same polic policies. And I'm afraid the same is going to happen in Germany because I get no sense there that Friedrich Merz has any idea or vision of changing course. He perhaps has some political room or would have some political room to do it, but I don't get the sense that he has any actual interest in doing so. So we're going to get a Merz government in Germany Continuing the course, the disastrous course, staked out by Olaf Scholz, Robert Habeck and Annalena Baerbock, even as we get a Trump administration in the United States, which is showing at least some signs of reconsidering the entire approach. It doesn't seem like a winning formula to me. But it does demonstrate the degree of paralysis, the immobilism in Germany, which has been developing in that country for some time, ever since Angela Merkel took over as Chancellor all those years ago. Well, anyway, that's what I'm going to say about Germany. It's an interesting and developing story, and no doubt we will return to it. Now, all of this has left me very little time to discuss the military situation in Ukraine, but I will quickly touch on things. Firstly, all the information is that the Russians continue to advance. Um, apparently, in the area uh, north of Ugladar, um, in west of Marinka, the Russians have now captured fully the village of Antonovka, which lies north of Katerinovka, which they captured some days ago. Uh, today, North of the Kurakovo Reservoir, the Ministry of Defence is apparently reported, I haven't seen the report myself, but I believe it is there, that the village of uh, Kremenaya Balka, um, west of Selidovo, has also fallen under Russian control. The Russians are pushing forward fast in all of these places. And to repeat what I said in my programme yesterday, in this area of southwest Donbass, where the major battle of the war is taking place, the Russian army is advancing with increasing rapidity against what appears to be declining Ukrainian resistance. You can see armoured columns trundling across the roads and the fields. There's no sign of Ukrainian artillery or drones resisting them. Village after village falls under Russian control. There's a report that there's now only nine kilometers distance between the Russian pincers that are closing around Kurakovo, west of the Kurakovo reservoir. There's also reports, further confirmed reports, that speak of Russian troops having reached the center of Kurakovo itself. And in fact, all of the indications are that the Ukrainian defences in Western Donbass are collapsing. The other thing we've heard is that General Sirsky, the 
military commander of Ukraine is now saying that the Ukrainians have achieved their objectives in the Kursk region. This has come directly after uh, the secretary of Russia's Security Council, in other words, Putin's uh, national security advisor, Sergei Shoigu, the former defense minister, told a meeting of national security advisors from former republics of the Soviet Union who were meeting in Moscow about the nature of the Kursk operation. According to TASS, and I'm quoting from TASS now, Shoigu pointed out that Kiev's aggression in the Kursk region was aimed at seizing the new Kursk nuclear power plant, which Shoigu described as nothing short of an act of nuclear terrorism. And um, Shoigu also spoke about this in the context of attacks on the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, about which there have been more reports, by the way. And Shoigu said that the Western powers are losing in Ukraine and that they're losing their global leadership, that they're now effectively living in debt. More and more states are abandoning the dollar and the euro as instruments for saving mutual settlements. It is clear that this situation does not suit Western elites. He also strongly endorsed the election result in Georgia and made clear that the Russians do not result except the result of the presidential election in Moldova, which he said was achieved through blatant manipulations. Uh, the rights of Moldovan citizens living in Russia were violated. This is from Shoigu. Only two polling stations were opened and only 10,000 ballots were sent. This was allegedly justified by security reasons. So, Sirsky says they're going to pull out of Kursk region. The Russians are saying that the objective was to seize the nuclear power plant, the Kursk nuclear power plant, as I have been saying all along. That is now the official Russian position. That it has been ever since August, but it's now been stated forthrightly and repeatedly. The fact that the Russians are saying it all the time suggests that they too are sensing that the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian military, has made a decision to pull out of Kursk region. And that might be what Sirsky's words imply. Now, why the Ukrainians would do that, who knows? Maybe it is Donald Trump's victory in the United States that has driven them to take that step. Maybe Zelensky has been finally persuaded of the folly of the whole Kursk operation. Who's to say? And of course, we don't yet know for a fact that it will happen. But we could be looking at the last days of the Kursk offensive, ill-starred and ill-conceived as that was. But everywhere else in southwestern Donbass, in Chasovya and Toretsk, along the Zherebets and Oskol rivers, in Seversk, everywhere, the Russians continue their advance. And in southwestern Donbass, that advance is accelerating, and there is more and more talk of an eventual Russian push to the Dnieper. Well, this is where I finish my program today. There'll be more from me soon. We'll see whether or not, or rather, we will see who Donald Trump appoints first to his transition team and then to his forthcoming administration. There'll be much to watch and listen to and discuss there and of course we will see what if anything happens with respect to Ukraine but to repeat on Ukraine the Russians have made their position clear and it is firm and it is the one we have always known so let me remind you again you can find all our programs on our various platforms locals uh, rumble and x you can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar and by going to our shop, links under this video. If you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. And well, that's me for today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.